Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Hopewell Chingono, who is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and journalist. Enjoy this fascinating conversation. <music> Uh, Hopewell Rugoho Chingono. I, I made sure Hopewell, I, I bring that name in because as I was reading around you, I found that, uh, that name. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. I'm very excited to have you on the show today, Hopewell. Thank you for inviting me to the show, Trevor. Shall we start with the name? Rugoho Chingono. Uh, the Rugoho is not in the public domain. Talk to me about that. Uh, so the issue is that uh, these are two names. Uh, one belongs to my father, one belongs to my great-grandfather. Um, so we originally came from the Barwe tribe, uh, from the Mozambique uh, Manicaland border area. So these names, they prove that uh, tribalism is pretty useless because we live in Murewa and when I'm in Murewa, I'm called Zezuru. But uh, essentially, I came from the Manikal and uh, Mozambique area. And uh, my great grandfather, Mkusha, who is, uh, he came with his own brother called Bakasa. So Hope, Hope Sadza is my cousin. Mm. So that's, that's where it came from. That's why it sounds a bit unique. It's very unique. Where were you born, uh, Hopewell, and where did you go to school? I was born at Arado Hospital uh, 49 years ago, and uh, I went to school in Murewa. I went to a couple of schools uh, because of the Liberation War. We kept moving. My father was a, a civil servant. So I went to a couple of schools, but essentially for my primary school, I went to Murewa Mission, and I went to Kudakwashi Government School in Glenora. And then for my high school, I went to Murewa Mission for my uh, junior certificate. And for my O-levels, I went to Fletcher High School. And for my A-levels, I went to Marlborough High School here in Arare. Mm -hmm. Tell me, the, the way you were raised, any, any uh, issues that uh, uh, still remain with you in your mind in terms of the values that, uh, you know, molded you, Hopo? Um, I think, you know, my father taught me uh, to interrogate issues and uh, he taught me to read. So he would always bring newspapers back home and I would uh, read and we, whichever way I would um, formulate my ideas, I would then discuss with him. So I remember vividly in 1985 when I was at Mrewa uh, Mission, um, the then Robert government, uh, Rob, the then Robert Mugabe government uh, sent a, a group of thugs to hound out priests that were perceived to be under ZANU PF. And I remember vividly in 1985, 1986, my father standing up in church at Mrewa to challenge that. So my father always said to me, You need to stand up for what you believe in. Nobody's going to stand up for you. Uh, you have to fight for what is right and what you believe to be right. Mm -hmm. So your father was a priest? My father was a civil servant, but he was a very uh, devout uh, churchman. Okay. And mom, on, on mom's side, what did you pick up from mom's side in terms of uh, your upbringing? Uh, well, I'm the last born in my family. The difference between me and my late brother, the one that I came after, is nine years. So my mother brought me up uh, in, in a way where I was told that there's no work for boys, there's no work for girls, you have to do everything. So I'm able to cook, I'm able to bake cakes, uh, I'm able to do things that most men in Zimbabwe think are meant for women. So I think that side came from my mother. Wow, quite, quite a, a rounded uh, uh, bringing there. And then you then went uh, to uh, the Zimbabwe Institute of Mass Communication, uh, uh, Hopewell, to, to study journalism. I see the books behind you, uh, a books person, obviously, somebody who reads quite a lot. 
when you look at the years that you spent at the Zimbabwe Institute of Mass Communication and what you've gone through right now, is this what you, money, what you imagined you would be? Uh, I didn't think so. I just thought that I was going to go into uh, journalism school, start journalism and uh, start writing as a newspaper man. Um, because at that point in time, it was 1991, um, when I went into journalism school, things were normal in Zimbabwe. There was no problem. And um, I never assumed uh, that we would end up in a situation where journalists become targeted as they are today. I just thought our job was just to report the news and write opinion pieces. And uh, I mean, I used to look up to people like yourself when you were the editor in the Financial Gazette. And I thought, wow, we want to be like that guy one day you know, and, 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 um, and be known for doing what is right. And uh, I remember talking to the then information minister, Dr. Nathan Shamiri, he was telling us his own story, uh, how he left the country. And we never thought we'd have to replicate the same journey that uh, he walked of having to leave the country and having to fight for his rights. And, uh, but unfortunately, that's where we are today again. Mm. You have... Um done quite a lot, uh, hopefully, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, going to school and you've won quite a number of uh, awards. What has been the highlight for you up to now as far as your journey is concerned? I know you worked for BBC. You became, I think, the only Nim and Fellow in Zimbabwe. Explain those uh, uh, landmarks for Zimbabwe and then the, the people in the diaspora are watching us now. What, what your journey has been and what the highlights of that journey has been? I think, I think for me, the highlight of my career was winning the African Journalist of the Year Award, uh, the CNN African Journalist of the Year Award in 2008 in Ghana. And um, I received the, wa the award from the then Ghanaian president, uh, John Kufo. And I remember the next day when he invited us to his uh, presidential palace, having a discussion about Zimbabwe and... Um, he said to me, you know, what has gone wrong with your country? Uh, we used to look up to Zimbabwe. It was the second biggest economy uh, in terms of productivity and in terms of intellectual capital in Africa, after South Africa. But what went wrong? Um, and before I left uh, the afternoon lunch, which we had with him, he said to me, you know, you need to go back home and continue doing what you're doing, highlighting these uh, issues. Trust me, politicians, listen. We might not uh, pretend to be listening, but we listen. And um, it was a highlight of my career as, a, as a winning the award, but what was more important uh, was to have this kind of discussion with an African leader. And it gave me confidence um, in understanding that at some point where you think that you're going crazy, you're going mad, actually there is somebody who shares the same position with Robert Mugabe, who was the president at that time, who believes in what you are doing. And uh, so that gave me a lot of confidence. And it also, uh, I would imagine, gave confidence to a lot of young Zimbabwean journalists because they saw me growing up and, you know, they could now see that they also could do the same thing that I did because I was brought up in Mrewa, uh, a part of me, it was in the ghetto in Glenora. I went to the Zimbabwe Institute of Mass Communications at the Harare Polytechnic, the same journey that they walked. And so to see me win such an award, uh, um, a lot of people, a lot of young journalists came to me and said it inspired them mm. to, to go as far as I'd done or even further. Mm. What, what piece of work actually got you that, uh, that award? It was a documentary film called Pain in My Heart, which looked at HIV and AIDS in Zimbabwe. It was looking at the lives of two people, one who was on medication, on ARVs, and another, a woman and a single mother of, of two who was not on uh, ARVs. And I filmed the two of them for four months until the woman died. So essentially, uh, you know, one of the doctors in the film, Professor Chirati Zondlovo, uh, she later told me that the film in a way changed the perceptions in terms of ARVs uh, because people could see that if you are put on ARVs, you can live a normal life uh, and you can live up to the time where you're supposed to die even if you didn't have HIV and AIDS. So I was, I was very happy that it changed attitudes it made people realize the importance of putting people on uh, um, 
medication, uh, which is called a ARVs and retrovirals. And unfortunately, this film was made in 2007, and now we are back to the same situation again, where a lot of our people who are HIV positive, sometimes they go for a month or two without medication, and it compromises their immunity because they become resistant to that specific drug. Mm -hmm. And the country does not have the resources um, in the health delivery system to make those people change to another drug which assists them. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that uh, when you came back from the scholarship, the, is it the Shevening uh, scholarship, your career tilted towards documentary making rather than journalism. Explain to me the reason for that shift. So I I immediately after I left, uh, uh, when, I, when I graduated from the Zimbabwe Institute of Mass Communications, I left Zimbabwe for the United Kingdom. Uh, and I did a master's in uh, international journalism, being trained as a foreign correspondent, but I majored in radio journalism. And uh, I then joined the BBC. And when I came back home, after having done my internship at the BBC, I was given a contract by the BBC to work from Zimbabwe because that was during the culmination of the land reform program and all foreign correspondents had been kicked out of Zimbabwe. Mm. So when I came back home, I thought I could continue with my career as a BBC correspondent based in Harare, but it never really worked out that way because I was then banned, the BBC was banned. And um, two years later, I won a Shevening scholarship um, to go back to England. And I chose to study, I had two options to study human rights or to do a master's in um, filmmaking. So I chose filmmaking. And when I came back to Zimbabwe, I made my first film. That's the film that won the African Journalist of the Year Award. And um, I wanted to focus on documentary films only, mm. but it was difficult because we only have one television station in Zimbabwe. And unfortunately we've become the only country of significance to have only one television station. So it's difficult to make films when you don't have a platform to air those films on locally. Mm. So I ended up going into television, doing films and doing news. I joined uh, ENCA and, uh, and then I joined ITV News, which is the biggest British news uh, broadcaster outside the BBC in Britain. Mm. And uh, so I moved from radio and, and that transition was caused by the masters that I did in Britain, which was in film. So I ended up in, in television. So I was you, making films and at the same time I was doing news. You, you then did another documentary, State of Mind. Um, speak to me about that. Why did you do that documentary and what was it all about? Um, before I did State of Mind, I had done a documentary called A Violent Response. Uh, which won two awards in Britain and in Canada, and it was looking at the post-election violence. So I became caricatured as, a, as somebody who's focused on uh, just the wrongdoings of what's happening in Zimbabwe. And um, so in 2016, when I left ITV News, I started writing as a freelance uh, journalist for the New York Times whilst I was preparing to go back into uh, making films full time. And I had always wanted to make a documentary film on mental illness because my mother uh, suffered from a mental illness disorder for 25 years. So I thought that it was important to make this film and I went back to the hospital where she was treated, which was Arari Hospital, to make that film because there was a lot of, uh, and there's still a lot of stigma on mental illness in Zimbabwe. So I was looking at myself and I said, if I can tell this story, it might help others who have got fathers, mothers, relatives who are suffering from mental illness to realize that mental illness is just a condition that if treated well, uh, someone can live their normal lives. That's how I ended up making, making the film. Mm, fantastic. And it, it's, it's won quite a number of awards. Uh, well done for that. Um, Hopo, let's move now to um, your assessment of uh, the profession of journalism right now, particularly investigative journalism. What's your take on where our journalism is and investigative journalism in particular? Um, I'm, I'm sure you know this as a newspaper owner. Um, I've had so many struggles trying to explain to our compatriots 
that journalism does not live in isolation of everything else. If you have got an economy that is not working, it's going to affect every facet of our life. It's going to affect every sector and industry of our life. And so journalism has suffered uh, consequently because of that. And it is difficult for newspaper owners like yourselves to be expected to pay big salaries when they're not able to sell the product because the economy is dead. So because of that, journal journalists became susceptible to bribery, receiving brown envelopes. And uh, a lot of stories are killed by journalists themselves, not by publishers. And uh, I've had to argue so many times with people asking why Trevor's papers are not publishing this. And I've always said that I've spoken to Trevor's editors and they've told me that the stories are killed by journalists themselves, not by the publisher. And I want to applaud you for allowing your newspapers uh, to, to, to publish as they should. And, and I want to assure the viewers that uh, Trevor Nube does not interfere in the uh, policies of um, his editors and newspapers. Tell me, th thank you for that. Tell me, do you think brown envelope journalism is a big thing in, 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 in Zimbabwe? Uh, journalists taking bribes to write stories and to kill stories? Do you think it's, it's, it's prevalent? It is very prevalent. It's a big problem because it cuts across uh, the stables. It's not necessarily found only in state media. It's also found in, in private media. Uh, you would find that uh, the, the, the only newspapers that published the corruption exp exp uh, exposures that have been taking place in the past uh, four weeks are only your newspapers. The other newspapers did not publish them at all. Uh, it's as if the stories did not exist, uh, but they were being published in Swaziland, they were being published in South Africa, they were published in Namibia, but certain newspapers just decided not to publish them. And I cannot imagine anything else other than, you know, brown envelope uh, journalism taking place. Do you, you don't think that there might be fear um, in certain quarters to publish uh, uh, stories of, of corruption uh, rather than it being just um, the brown envelope journalism? I think it's driven, uh, the fear is driven uh, in, in, in certain instances by the editors uh, and they f it filters down to journalists. But the motivating uh, factor for the editor to generate that fear is not necessarily fear in itself, uh, but it's, it's, it's some kind of capture that would have taken place between the political elites and the editors. And the journalists, they can only submit stories to the editor and the editor decides what they want to publish. The, the, and, and this capture is the, journal, the editor gets paid uh, to be captured by politicians and businessmen. Is that your, the sense that you're getting? Um, you know, I spoke to one of your editors and, and he gave me a very interesting analogy where he said that they would discuss a story uh, in, in a newsroom. And after an hour of discussing the story in their diary, he gets a call from the person who's supposed to be investigated, uh, which means that it's not only the editors, it's the journalists as well. You find that in a newsroom, you have certain camps, one that writes pro-MDC, the other one writes pro-ZANU-PF, and it comes down to uh, issues of re issues of money and uh, bribery, because there's no reason why one would decide that they just want to write about uh, this group favorably over the other group. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's, it's very prevalent and it's unfortunate, but that's what happens, Trevor, when you are working in an economy that is dead. Mm -hmm. If journalists were well paid, if mm -hmm. policemen were well paid, there won't be any need for them to take briberies. And, and I've lived in societies, and you've done as well, where journalists are well paid and policemen are well paid, and the level of bribery is very low. So it's about the economy at the end of the day. If we have a robust economy that's working, there's no need for a journalist to take uh, $50 to queue a story when he's getting paid $8,000 a month. It doesn't make sense. Wow, that's an indictment of our profession, isn't, uh, isn't it, uh, uh, Hopewell? It did. Mm. Let's move now to, uh, correct me, when Emerson Nangagwa became president in 2017, am I right that you were largely supportive of him and generally critical of uh, MDC? Am I correct? 
I was supportive of the change process that we thought was taking place. And it wasn't just, I remember I was getting attacked and you were getting attacked too. But speaking for myself, I was quite aware that the MDC was also in support of that change. I remember the MDC leader calling the change miraculous. Um, and I remember Morgan Changrai saying that it will be remembered as a historic in the same proportion as uh, we remember 1980 when we moved from colonial rule to uh, self-rule. And for me, I looked at the constitution and the constitution stipulated that the next president after the current president resigns comes from the party of the president that has resigned. So there was no ifs and buts about who's going to be the next president. And I remember the MDC as well, endorsing uh, Morgan Changrai, and, and newspapers are there for, to that record. Mm. Um, sorry, I remember, I remember newspapers uh, publishing stories of the MDC endorsing uh, the presidents of Emerson Mnangagwa. So there was no point really for us to fight something that we could not change. And Emerson Mnangagwa had promised that he was going to deliver the change that we were looking for. And looking at the uh, state of affairs in our country, everything was in shambles. So to fight a guy that was saying he was going to change things and we knew we had no other way of removing him, even if we wanted him to be removed, it was pointless. Mm -hmm. So that was the basis in which I said, I'm going to give this guy a chance. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the MDC uh, then regrouped after they lost their founding uh, leader, Morgan Changrai, and Nelson Shamisa took over. And the problem at that point in time, which Shamisa himself acknowledges, is that each time we criticized what the MDC was doing, when we were saying you need to go to rural areas, you can't win an election without rural areas, you would get attacked and people would say that you are pros and OPF. So the polarity in our country is such that if you expose corruption, ZANU-PF will say you are pro-MDC. If you expose the weaknesses of the MDC, MDC supporters will say you're pros and OPF. But we need to create a society where I'm able to criticize uh, Trevor's newspapers without Trevor thinking that I hate him, mm -hmm. but thinking that I'm trying to expose a weakness mm -hmm. which can only make his newspaper uh, group become better. Mm -hmm. And the same applies to politics as well. Mm -hmm. If ZANU PF imagines that everyone who's against corruption is against ZANU PF, as an organization, we just hate them. Mm. It kills the whole idea of building a society because a society is built on principles, mm. not on party jackets that we wear. Mm. So if ZANU-PF does good, we applaud it. If the MDC does good, we applaud it. If both parties do bad, we criticize them. That's the kind of society that I want my children to grow up in. Mm. Um, so you you were you were sympathetic. You were you 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 say let's give uh, uh, Emerson Nangagwa a chance. Something has changed, uh, uh, Hopewell. What has changed for you? I started seeing the change when I was approached by the government to assist them in reforming uh, media institutions which were under government. I was I got a call from. Uh, Mr. Christopher Mchanga, who at that time was President Mnangagwa's advisor. And he said to me, his wife wanted to talk to me about media reforms because his wife, Monica Mchangwa, had been appointed as the new information minister for Zimbabwe. So I met Mr. Mchangwa, who is a very um, good person, adorable, I adore her. She's a very good person when you engage with her one-to-one. -one. And she said to me, you know, she wanted to implement the things that I've always talked about, which are political reforms, and in this case, media reforms. But she said she needed assistance from those of us that criticized the government for having created the monster that ZBC and Zim papers had become. And so I agreed, I said to her, okay, I'll write a paper for you. So I wrote a paper for her and I gave her the paper and she was happy with the paper. She said, okay, I need you to tell me how we need to do this now. Because you have told us what needs to be done, but who do we work with? So she gave me, after I explained to her that engage your donor partners, she asked me 
to talk to donor partners and see who could come on board. So I spoke to the Brits who at that time tentatively put three million pounds on the table and which they said was going to come through BBC Trust to give ZBC journalists ongoing training for three years. Mm. And I went back to my old boss at ITV News, uh, Jeff Hill, who agreed to send a whole bureau from Johannesburg for ITV News to come and train ZBC journalists. I then went to CNN and CNN uh, gave ZBC a deal that they've never given anyone uh, in Africa which was they were going to send Krishna Mampo to train ZBC journalists for two weeks, and they were going to give ZBC an affiliate status. So ZBC would now have access to 900 television stations, which are affiliate stations of CNN. So the breaking news link was also given to them, and they were going to get equipment. But the problem started when the minister started to try and push uh, to make it work. She met resistance. And uh, a couple of months after that, I, I saw in the Herald newspaper, which is controlled by the government, the spokesperson for the president, George Charamba, wrote a very um, terrible article calling me a Western puppet, uh, a Western pawn for trying to professionalize ZBC, something that the government itself had asked me to do. I must say in October of 2018, Mrs. Mchangwa called me to her office, and uh, when I got there, she was with her permanent secretary, uh, Nick Mangwana. They offered me a job uh, to go to ZBC as a board director. I turned down the job because I said, uh, I'm, I'm doing things elsewhere. I'm a filmmaker. I just want to assist my country. This is my contribution to my country as a citizen who has access to all these big international broadcasters and who has been trained uh, to do the kind of work um, that is done by institutions like ZBC. Mm -hmm. I did not want a job. But a couple of months later, I started seeing them writing about how I wanted a job at ZBC. At that point, I realized that, you know, the new dispensation was actually a new deception. There was no, nothing new about it. The same old attacks that we were getting from Robert Mugabe, we were now getting them from the Mnangagwa government. Mm. So t now it's them saying you were claim the, claiming this and you were saying they offered you this. I mean, the public would say now, who do we believe, Hopewell or uh, Monica Mtswangwa? No, I have to be clear. M Mrs. Mchangwa never said that. Okay. Um, she, she, she stood with the truth. Yeah. And she never denied that she offered me a job because in the bigger scheme of things, uh, it was never a big issue. It, giving me a job was in good faith for her because she was saying I recognize your skills. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but at that point in time, I said to her, I can't take this job because I'm doing other things. I just want to assist you with the reforms that are required because media reforms were part of uh, the requirements to remove the sanctions that uh, have been with Zimbabwe for over 20 years. And one of the president's, um, in fact, two of the president's uh, advisors, <coughs> Shinga Shingimnyeza and Edwin Manikai, asked me to assist because they said, look, young man, you understand these things. You understand uh, the importance and the value to the country if these sanctions are removed. So this is your area, you understand these things help us. And I said, okay, it's difficult to criticize someone and then not offer the help when you have the skills to do so. So I'll offer the help as a citizen, but not as an employee of ZBC. So everyone who was engaged with me officially understood that and they've never said anything bad about me. It is people within the regime, like uh, people within the government service, like George Charamba, who then started attacking me. But otherwise with Mrs. Mchangwa, um, everything was fine. I understood their limitations that it was not about her, but it was about the system and how it works. Mm. So in interesting, Hopewell, um, you, to use your words, the system and the way that it works. So there, is an in, there are entrenched interests in the system that push back, and that is what you experienced. Am I right? That's correct. I, I experienced a situation where the minister would uh, be so excited about something um, she would ask me to do something, to speak to somebody. I would pick up the phone and I would tell her that I've spoken 
to the Australian ambassador and she said that uh, she was going to talk to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation to see whether they can assist with skills training and equipment and the minister will be so uh, excited about it. But after a couple of days, I assume that after having presented it to her political masters, it was turned down. In fact, they will never be changed, Trevor, as long as certain interests are still in government. Because certain interests in government, unfortunately, I have to say this, people like George Aramba, they thrive when there's chaos. They don't thrive when there's harmony. So anything that changes the reality of life in Zimbabwe to become better, they oppose it. Because if we have a better national broadcaster, it means filmmakers can thrive. It means musicians can thrive. It means even business people like yourself can thrive because you can feed your content through the national broadcasters well. they can buy content from you. And media is a business, but there's this huge obsession with news, which is only broadcast for one hour at eight o'clock. And my argument to the minister, which she had understood and agreed to, was that we would warehouse ZBC News, it remains theirs, it's not touched. The personnel is just trained to become better reporters, to know how to use the latest equipment, to know how to engage with other international broadcasters. But I was more interested in changing the content side, which is the stuff that the housewives and the uh, house husbands watch whilst their spouses are at work. We subject our citizens to terrible television. The poorest of the poor in this country, living in places like Matapi in Bari, you see that they are set like dishes. In a normal society, people should watch SABC 1, SABC 2, SABC 3 in South Africa to go to DSTV to satellite television. It's a luxury. But in this country, satellite te television is a necessity for everyone because the content that is being generated, be it documentaries, be it music, be it films, it's such, you know, substandard that our people have ended up having to subscribe even, you know, in Bari, where they struggle to buy a meal. But in order to get entertainment, they've had to subscribe to satellite television. And that's the side that I had suggested to the minister that it needed sorting out. When you sort that out, you know, people are not bothered about news because as you and I know, Trevor, uh, people get news from different sources. It's not like in the 80s. But our government is still stuck in the 80s where they think they can control the flow of, of information. They can't. The world has changed and they need to change with it too. Fascinating, uh, Hopewell. So the, the national uh, interest have been held hostage by a few individual, individuals in government who are afraid that the more people are empowered, the more opportunities and the more discourse and dialogue there's going to be, the more we're going to have our culture developed because we're creating films and so forth. Is that what you're saying? Yes, they are worried about people becoming independent. And some of them use these institutions as piggy banks. So you'd find that uh, looting scandals, uh, uh, embezzlement scandals at ZBC are many. And the people who make the decisions whether ZBC becomes a decent television station or not are the same people who are involved in the looting. So it cuts across government. Change is resisted because it brings a, a different dimension. It removes the ability for them to engage in corrupt activities. And the same applies to the political reforms that I always talk about. Mm -hmm. It is because these political reforms are going to bring change. So if you look at an institution like uh, National Railways of Zimbabwe, if it's run properly, it means you have to appoint competent managers and competent managers don't engage in incompetent behavior. And incompetent behavior is the only thing that oils corruption in this country, that oils looting. Because if you appoint me as one of your editors, Trevor, and I know that I'm not capable of being an editor, but I've been appointed there, 
I will then have to play ball with all the corrupt activities. So if you look at what happened in the Minister of Health, the corruption that's taking place there, it's enabled by people who are not competent but are given jobs. And that would go away if we implement political reforms because for someone to become a CEO of National Railways of Zimbabwe, to become a CEO of Zim Papers of, or ZBC, you have to be subjected to a public interview where you will be exposed if you're not competent. Your qualifications, your track record, everything has to be interrogated. Mm. But at the moment, it's not the case. So if you implement reforms, it goes away. You bring the competence aspect that should be applied in order for this country to, to move forward, in order for this country to thrive economically. So these people who were part of the Mugabe years and are now part of the Mnangagwa years, are the ones who are standing in the way. So even people like Monica Mchangwa, who really wanted, and I know she really wanted change to happen at ZBC, they're not capable of pushing that agenda because it's blocked. And once you are labeled a Western puppet, more so if you are in government, you pull back mm -hmm. because that's a signal that you have become anti-ZANU-PF anti and you're not supporting the president. Let's zero in now on the uh, political reforms, uh, hopeful, that you've been talking about. Can you be specific in terms of which are the reforms that you think would uh, uh, change uh, the, 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 the nation?